Looks like we can start. So welcome, this is uh, the Parlay's talk. Um, first, uh, a practical thing. You just all received uh, a coupon, a jeton. Uh, so with that jeton, you will get your Parlay's t-shirt. So after this talk, you can go to the registration desk, and there we will have actually different sizes. So we have small, medium, large, extra large, and uh, you can you know, exchange that. Um, so cool, thanks for coming. It's the last uh, talk. Ah. Why are you clapping? <laughs> for the t-shirt? You're just here for the t-shirt? <laughs> yeah, just go out and then we can relax. I mean, don't stay here. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, it's a cool t-shirt, right? Uh, this increases your market value by 100 euros per day. So keep that in mind. So I'm joined with uh, Ben and, and Jo. And um, OK, let's go, let's go through it. So a bit more details about the team. The, as you know, you have probably already know me, so that's fine. Um, I started basically Parlays. Well, that's a nice inter uh, anecdote. I started Parlays uh, basically because I wanted to see the talks that were happening in the conference that I organize. Uh, because I run around constantly, and a lot of our team members as well, and we're just missing all the good stuff. Right? So we, we're organizing this for like eight months, and then we don't see our own g heroes and authors and spec leads. And so I said, like, no, okay, we can't do that. So we had to record it so at least we could enjoy it ourselves. And then in the beginning, before we could really stream, we actually made DVDs. Who, who still remembers the DVDs part? Yeah, exactly. So, but you know, we always have these interesting themes. So we had like one time we had the Java Sutra. So we had different spoons in different positions, like the Kama Sutra, but for spoons. And then the DVD had that theme on the box. So what happened is that these DVDs were sold all over the world, and only 50% actually reached the, the, the buyer. You know what happened? The postman thought that these were porn DVDs, <laughs> and he kept it in his own pocket. So I was like, man, so this is obviously not the right way to actually distribute contents. And that's where I started then with Parlays on the website. That's how it started, seriously. Yeah. So that's, anyway. So Benjamin actually joined me, I think it was five, five to six years ago. Exactly, five um, years, yeah. Well, basically, you can quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Benjamin Doppler. I'm a front-end developer from Berlin, Germany. Well, that's it. <laughs> He's, so a, he's too modest. Maybe, um, so I, I did Flash and Flex exclusively for like 12 years. And <laughs> so like a year ago, I had to think about what to do. <laughs> Cause he, had a, he basically had a midlife crisis before he was actually at that age that he should have. It was like just a technical midlife crisis. Like, okay, uh, am I going to drop Flash and just do pure JavaScript? He was, uh, we really had to push him, right? Do you remember that? <laughs> and I think he's now, you know, what's the status? You're completely sold, aren't you? Yeah, I think I found my new drug. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So on the other picture, that's uh, you and me in San Francisco receiving uh, the Duke's Choice Award. And yo, you can quickly introduce yourself. No, I, I have no <laughs> mic. Well, I'll do it for you. That's fine. Oh, you have a hand mic. Um, yes, hello. I'm Joe. Um, I've been uh, involved in DevOps for a couple of years now um, as a steering member and also in BJAC. And I think I joined Parlays and uh, the DevOps tools development team, I think, about a year, a year and a half ago. Yeah. So, and uh, my background is mainly um, Java backend and frontend. And uh, now I'm also doing a lot of uh, frontend JavaScript stuff and really liking it. Okay, so this is the agenda. Um, ben is going to show, show you first the demo, and just out of interest to know how long the demo should be, how, who saw the demo at the opening keynote? Okay, so maybe reverse it. Who didn't? So only two hands. Yeah, tough luck. You'll see it on Parlays. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's going to do a, a demo nevertheless. So what we we're going to do is going to start with the demo. I'll talk a bit about JaxRS, Swagger, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, and then you will do the second part, which is our new heroes. And you will be hit with quite a, a lot of new APIs, which I even don't know. So these guys are doing the client side. I've been focusing mainly on the server side, so that's why I'll, I'll do that part. So but let's start with the demo first. Um, and that's your cue. All right. So. I will not show exactly the same stuff I showed in the keynote, but I, I try to quickly go through it so the people who have not been there can see it. So there's, there's one big feature that I want to show that 
uh, we couldn't show in the keynote. But um, so yeah, that's it. Um, so yeah, that's the new Palais, um, completely built in HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, no plugins involved. And actually, after the keynote, there was one tweet where somebody said, "So it was a missed opportunity. We could have built it in Java FX, but I, I, that's not." The reason why we did HTML, we, we don't want any plugins anymore, so <laughs> it's not really an alternative. Um, yeah, so. But you could definitely do it you uh, could as a desktop even. client, I mean. Yeah, but uh, I mean, with HTML5, you don't really need a desktop client anymore. That's no. the cool thing. Um, yeah, so let's go to channel. That's uh, the DevOps 2011 channel. And uh, maybe some stuff that I can show that we haven't really showed in the keynote. So. Uh, sorry. Um, so full screen. So um, the, the site is completely built on uh, Twitter Bootstrap. I can't really see the edge of my screen. Then don't do it full screen. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, responsive. So uh, it also works on tablets and would probably also work on phones, but. Um, that's the question if it really makes sense to watch Palais on a phone. But at least on a tablet it would work. So if you resize, you, you see how it reflows. And like when you make it really small, the, the one column with the channel it disappears and it's underneath that one. And yeah, so some, some kind of responsiveness is in there. And so when I select the talk, um, we have the player. And also when I resize that, you see at a certain degree, um, it will change the slides so that they are uh, on top of each other, so that fits better. In on a tablet or on a mobile phone. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so and then the, the big feature that we introduced here is before we had a publisher application. It was basically a desktop application where we um, can, can do the post-processing of the oh, tools. Hold on, we need to take a picture with the team first. <laughs> right. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> Sorry. So, where have we been? Okay, uh, we had to publish a desktop application, but um, with this version, we wanted to try to put everything in, in, in one application. So, we have this editor here, as most of you have seen already. Um, and here I can do some post processing. And so, I, I've showed that already, and um, I want to show now how you would create a new talk. So, basically, show you how we uh, post process talks for Palais. Um, in HTML. In HTML, yeah. Um, so uh, the URL is then new talk. And then I, I get a, an empty timeline. So that's still a small bug that the, the image does not get cleared. But it's empty now. And um, then I can import some media. So Keep in mind that this is still work in progress. So. Um, there's still a few edges here and there. Yeah. So uh, for, for DevOps, what we have is we have the screen recording. So what you see on this side, we get that as a video stream. And then we have the speaker video. Um, and those are the two videos we get. And then we get a PDF of the presentation. And so let me first import the slides. And drag them to the timeline so we see the, the real view. Um, so now I have the, the slides in. But we don't want to have the, the complete slide video online. So um, what we do is that we go through the whole video uh, and see where does the slide change, and then put the PDF slide on there. And that's, that's a really crazy work. Uh, so yeah, you basically have to rewatch all the talks and do all the work then. Yeah, that's so what I did eight years ago. You know, I took Final Cut Before Pro. Before you met me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took Final Cut Pro, took about six to seven hours for a one hour talk and all do things manually, export it to XML, and that was like just a labor of love, but you know, without the sex, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, what you can do here now is you can uh, import also a PDF file, and that's pretty cool because it's all just done in JavaScript, so you can import that. It takes a bit longer, but what it's actually doing, it's using a library built by Mozilla. It's called PDF.js, and that's um, analyzing the PDF and, and doing all the encoding of the fonts and all crazy stuff. It, it's, it's really a, yeah, an awesome piece of work. So um, when I have that here, I can click on my PDF, and then I see all the slides, so a small preview. So now I can do basically what Stefan did. Uh, I can 
drag them onto my timeline and put them where they belong. And so you don't want to do that. That's really manual, again, labor of love work. It, this would take too long with like 200 sessions. Yeah. So um, we already had in the old Flex uh, client, we had um, some kind of scene detection so that it automatically finds out where to put those slides. And so we tried to recreate that here, but only in HTML. And uh, it works pretty well. So you can just take this PDF and drop it on the video. And then it starts the scene detection. And that takes quite a while. It's quite a complicated process. So it goes through the whole video and analyzes all the screens and sees first where they change. That's not so difficult. But then it also finds what slide of the PDF fits to that part of the video and then puts all the slides on the timeline. That, this is scary stuff, seriously. And it's just a progress bar, but behind it. So now you see the talk is basically done. So, but now we have only um, we have slides on the left and on the right. That's not what we want. So we import the speaker video, um, drop it on the timeline. Can you go full screen or you don't want to? Oh, just okay. Nice <laughs> So, and then I removed the slide video. And so there's the speaker and his slides, Finished. and we are done. So, you can applause pretty now. cool stuff. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So, this was like without talking, maybe one, two minutes. Now, this is for a normal talk, right? That this is where the speaker is just doing slides, and that's it. Once he does add demos, it becomes a bit more tricky. Right. Yeah, so when I have a demo, I, um, I would, like the, the step where I have the slide, um, when the speaker then goes to a demo, then you would not see the slide, but the demo that he's doing, and then you would just manually still um, split the video there, cut the demo out, um, remove the, the part around it. Um. But this is scary. I mean, seriously, this is just pure in HTML. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know that this was possible, seriously. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Well, well, it's going to be a challenge, I think, is that this now run, runs on Chrome, and, yeah. and we use the latest builds and so on. The nightmare will be, okay, having it run on the Internet Explorer and Firefox and <laughs> Opera and that type of stuff. So we, Yeah, it will be a nightmare, but it's kind of... Like with all the features, we are also thought about what can we do on the other browsers because it's, it's really pretty easy on Chrome where you have all the latest stuff implemented, even stuff that's only a proposal currently. Um, but like I think for nearly all major browsers, there are um, workarounds. And I mean, worst case, you can always fall back and include a f good old flash file <laughs> that yeah. doesn't work. Or we could also say, if, hey, if you want to use the publisher, you just need to use Chrome. I mean, that could be a first step, right? <laughs> yeah, the Google engineer in the room. <laughs> but, yeah, cool. Yeah. And, I mean, you've seen that uh, probably in the keynote, but uh, I can always go uh, offline. It detects that I'm offline. Hope I, I'm not on wireless, so I'm on a cable. It detects that I'm offline now. And um, you can just continue. I can just continue offline doing all my stuff on, on the plane, wherever I can go to my downloads and watch downloaded talks when I'm offline and so offline and so so that's really the beauty is that we in the past we had well today's production uh, version we had three clients we had the browser version well the flex version we had the air publisher version and we had the desktop version and we had to maintain those three different applications I mean there was a lot of reuse of code and libraries but now we just have one version. We can just focus on that one. And what's also very, very cool, we have a lot of people who are publishing and even are helping with uh, like post-processing Parlay Stocks for DevOx. If you want to help, let, let me know. Um, and you get a free ticket if you do more than five talks for next year's edition. <laughs> so that might be motivation. But what is really nice with this one here is that let's say that you have a problem post-processing then you just, you know, you, you drop us a mail or you ping us, we can just open that same project and just continue where you left over, where, where you stopped. So that's going to be really nice to see the synergies and, and you know, be, or, or somebody says, well, that slide isn't correctly because you just, so, you know, you, you, you're five seconds too late. Okay, you go in, you log in, poof, you change the slider, you sync it, poof, it's there. So, I'm, I'm, well, as you can see, I'm really excited about this. this I think this is what we would have needed. This should have been there six years ago, basically, but I think the technology was not ready at all. I mean, definitely not in HTML5. Yeah. Cool. 
All right, yeah, I think that's for the demo. Any questions on the demo itself before we go into some slides? Just yell. Yeah? Not yet, unfortunately. No, not yet. <laughs> because if you do, we will be way too late. So we want to still use our current publisher. Um, and yeah, it's going to take still, for 200 talks, it's still going to take us three weeks with a, quite a bit of team. Um, no. We're not, yet, not really ready yet with that. But like DevOps France will probably be the first one that... Or DevOps UK. Will, yeah. UK, UK yeah. will be the first one that will be processed completely in this client and published there and can be seen then in this client. Yeah. So that's a bit our deadline. We want to really make it available uh, end of March. Yeah, and then we, we want to do the full switch. So it should work then on all the browsers and... Because that's the dilemma we had. We would have been able to actually release this at DevOps here, um, but quite a few things were not yet completely ready. And the problem was also that we had to do a, like a phase micro migration. We would like to do a big bang migration, basically, so we don't have to maintain the old code and the old databases and stats and, and not write database migrators uh, code. So that's why we actually delayed it. Any other questions on demo while we st Yeah, sir? So we've completely standardized ourselves on MP4, uh, H264. Uh, that's what we use because you know, that's the most widely used. But it's an inter interesting question because the next question you should ask is say, hey, but it only is supported if you do HTML5 on two browsers. What about the other browsers? Well, we, we are cheating a bit. If the browser using the video tag doesn't support H264 MP4, we will actually use a flash player just for the video part as a fallback. But you won't see that. So uh, Matt Reibel's head would then just be a flash video player, which, again, uh, is, is transparent to the viewer. That way we don't, because we're not YouTube, so that way we only need to support one codec and not multi a multitude of that. Any other questions on this part? If not, we'll continue. Ah, you got a question? Yeah, it's hard to see with the light. Yeah? But why did you choose PDF as a format? Is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, because we don't, so, we don't support yet like uh, the different... Uh, f but the PDF is the most common way to get uh, the content out of a presenter uh, tool. Because otherwise you need to support PowerPoint, Keynote, what is it, Open uh, Office, uh, and so on. So just having PDF for us is the, the simplest way of doing that. Eventually, if we have a bit more resources, I would love to do what Slide Rocket did, where they really support like animations, and you can do. You could basically just create your presentation in Parallels and do the presentation from Parallels instead of using Keynote. Right? Uh, but that's a matter of resources. So just to be real lean, this is the team basically, and we're adding two more developers uh, next next month. And one sales guy, so that then will be with six people. Um, so you, you need to make choices uh, depending on the resources you have available. Yeah. Uh, another question? Yeah, sir? It was the animation yeah, then we switch, we show the video. So if there's like uh, Mark Reynolds, when he does his talk, he has, he has 200 slides with all sorts of animations. You say, like, okay. Right, we'll just show his face for the first five minutes, and then we'll just show the video of the slides, then we don't have to do anything. Okay, so, <laughs> a bit <laughs> pragmatic. Well, you know, it works. Okay, we, I think we need to switch to the slides and start talking a bit more technical. Is, this, is that the one? Mm, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So, what we basically wanted to do was really reboot Parlays um, and think about the, the issues we had um, from the, from the current version. So we want to re-evaluate re all the features from scratch. Um, we wanted to build an open platform for knowledge sharing. That's what Parallels is. And, but focus on usability, like you said. We really had, like, we, that's the first time we actually worked with an external designer who designed the screens and really look at, like, how will you use this? What does work? What doesn't work? We've looked at all the competition as well, which are just doing slides, not even the hard part, which is the video, and really look at the usability. It would be great, once you start using this, to give us feedback and, and input of how we can improve that. So a lower threshold also to use the environment. So you need to be able, like the speaker is finished, he uploads his PDF, the talk is there, like a chat uploads his PDF and he sees the channel DevOps 2012, the slides are already there instead of putting it on, uh, on SlideShare. And then we add the video in the evening, the raw material, and then a few weeks later we post-process it. So you have really a nice, more 
you know, a nicer flow of getting the content in there, also for you as a speaker, but also you for a conference organizer or a judge leader or whatever. Um, definitely we thought about scalability first. Uh, so this is a stateless environment. That means we don't even need a cluster Glassfish anymore. We just have multiple instances just for the player. And if one server goes down, it doesn't matter. We will have a, well, we're moving to uh, Amazon, so we'll have elastic load balancers there. And we'll just go to different instances. If the talks go live or we do live streaming, which we didn't do this year, um, we just add more instances and it just scales automatically. So that, that definitely was a, an important uh, decision from the architecture. And lightweight. So we're just using JSON backwards and forwards. It's just JAXRS talking to MongoDB. Uh, you will see a bit later. But very lightweight. We didn't want to have a 40 megabyte WAR file. We really want to have like a 2 megabyte WAR file. Just very simple to deploy and also to build and, and so on. So easy at runtime. Fewer dependencies. That was an interesting one. I'll come back to that one later on. Easy on the developer, really have the right tools, very, very snappy. I mean, I use IntelliJ, you use IntelliJ. I know Ben uses some other things for JavaScript, where it is. Sublime. Sublime. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, easy for the consumers and the content providers. No plugins, no extra software, just have it all in one location. Yeah. That was basically... And, and the content providers, that's also you guys, when you're talking um, at your local uh, jug or at your local um, company, if you do... Uh, like I know certain companies do like evening sessions. You can put your stuff on Parlays as well. That's, that's our goal, to get all of your content on our platform. So the first part was the, the JAXRS one, which I, I took uh, the responsibility for. I mean, we wanted to create a REST API. And based on the, the, the experience, um, we, we had a few options. Um, I had some experience with the Spring MVC REST MPI, M API, um, but I really wanted to follow the pure Java E spec. I didn't want to include lots of extra Spring framework dependencies anymore and just keep it you know, lightweight because we were focusing really on, on using Glassfish. So we, we chose the, the Java E standard for, for the REST uh, API implementation. You know, it's, it's very easy to If I understand it, it must be very easy. You know, I'm not that smart, so, so that's good. Um, you can annotate the POJO, so you can do some mapping there, and you can really, you know, create like this bridge between your, your data, your Mongo, map it, you know, use JAXB basically, and then, you know, throw it out uh, the window through the JAXRS calls. But what was really important, because I was doing the server, and those two guys were doing the client, we had to find a good way to actually document the REST interface, because it was constantly in flux. So I actually found through uh, a colleague of mine here, um, let me go to that one, is um, it's called Swagger. Who knows Swagger? Wow, only a few. So this is, if you've learned something out of this session, then this is definitely one you need to remember. So Swagger, in my opinion, is like Javadoc, you know, the Javadoc annotations, but for REST methods. Um, and I've actually pushed the spec lead uh, at Java 1, really asking him, you should really include that in the next spec of JAXRS, where we actually introduce annotations to document your JAXRS methods. So wh what does that do? Well, uh, it looks a bit like that. So this is like a REST method to get all the tags uh, for a specific uh, user token. Doesn't matter. But the yellow parts are actually the additional annotations that we add to document the REST interface. So, for example, I'm documenting at the top the API. So, the API here is tax, which is the operations about tax, very straightforward. For the method itself, we have an API operation where we give a description of, okay, retrieve all tax, it will return a list of tracks, it will be a string, which is basically JSON, and these are the possible error codes that can be returned, unauthorized or there's no tax found. And then within the JAXRS method itself, you can add an API parameter to say, okay, is this parameter required? And what does this parameter do? I know it's pretty verbose, but what the end result is, is this, let me go next. Come on. That's this one. So this is basically, yeah, we're, because this is actually on staging, so you could hit it. So that's why we, we've cleared uh, the URL there, um, because it's still in flux. But basically, you get a website, a very nice, rich website, which shows you all the different resources you have available. And if you click on, like, okay, get me all the, uh, on the homepage, get me the content or get me the channels or whatever, it will actually allow you to enter the user token, press it, and it will show you the URL and also the content that was returned. So this was basically my technical contract with the client-side team. 
right? And I didn't have to go to a wiki and document it, and, and it's always out of date. This was like constantly, you know, we're, we're doing continuous deployment. Uh, we, we deploy it uh, with Jenkins using uh, Nexus. Uh, it goes to Glassfish, and these guys have it, you know, in heartbeat, they have a new version of what the API they can use. And I think that works pretty well, right? It's, it's, it's awesome. I mean, you, you, you practically get it for free. Yeah. Just to add a few annotations, and it's very convenient. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah. So it's an open source project, so you don't have to pay for that. But I would love to see that in the spec, really. So that it should be part of the JAXA spec. Okay, moving on. So MongoDB, who doesn't know MongoDB? Okay, I've made my point, so I can skip that slide. But basically, we went for Mongo. It's, it's, yeah, it's bleeding fast. I remember Ben saying, like, Man, is this really coming from staging? He, he, was not, he couldn't believe that it was so fast. It's, it's bleeding fast. And I mean, the current version of Parlay is, is really, I think that's where I, my heart is a bit bleeding. It's really not snappy, snappy. Um, and that's because of all the, the JPA and the, you know, all the, the links and, and the, the eager and, uh, and the, the lazy loads and so on. And, you know, this here, really, you, I mean, you've made the map of how the JSON uh, structure should yeah, be. Yeah, so, so that's. So most of you probably know how, what uh, MongoDB is, that it's a database, but what's a bit different is that it's document-based. You don't have relations anymore, and you need to learn how to structure your data. And basically, it helped us because uh, in the old uh, relational data model, we had like the presentations, and that we had, then we had assets, and all these assets had different files for all the different formats. So you know you had to join a, f a bunch of all these different tables, and now you need to learn to think about, okay, what content do I need when I need to build my page, and then fit all this stuff together in a document, and then basically get stuff like uh, what, we, what you see here on the slide. So we basically also denormalized our database and really like try to structure it in, in such a way that you would just do one request and the JSON would already be fully ready to be presented within the player or whatever page you are. And that combination, that was, hmm. re I mean, that's the result of really yeah. having it very And fast. often the misconception is that you think, um, yeah, it's a NoSQL database, you, you're losing transaction and all that stuff, but actually you still have atomic operations. So for example, we can increment the view counters atomically. So uh, it, we don't have uh, any problems there. Um, and you also have the typical database stuff like your queries, your cursors, um, and even also these uh, new things like MapReduce to, to do ma uh, queries on, on massive data. So, but it's important, the last slide is that you don't have full text search. So that's definitely a gotcha. Because as you saw probably in, this, in the demo, we do have that search bar there. So you want to actually be able to search on the title, on the text, but what we also do is that when you upload the PDF, we actually extract the text out of the PDF so you can search on the content of the slides even. Right? But there we had to find uh, another solution. So who doesn't know Elasticsearch? Okay, wow, quite a few. Wow. So Elasticsearch, um, the founder, uh, Shay Bannon, is talking tomorrow, actually. And I heard from Steven Schurman, who is the CEO, which was the, he was involved with Spring Source. He, they just picked up $10 million last week in VC money. So you're going to hear Elasticsearch a lot more. But it's basically a scalable REST-enabled search engine. A very interesting um, technology. Underneath the covers, of course, Lucene is used. I mean, that's the heart of many search uh, uh, technologies. Um, but it's a community-driven open source, uh, uh, sorry, it is an open source product. And they, do, they don't support natively MongoDB. There is actually an open source plugin called uh, MongoDB River, which allows you to um, index the content of what you're saving into Mongo but they use a special technique through uh, clustering. So let me, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, it so it's on based the on the yeah. replication log between the multiple exactly. um, MongoDB uh, instances. So you need to set up two Mongo instances, and like you do with MySQL, if you have a master and slave, it actually sends a log from the master to the slave, and the slave picks up the log and actually uh, replays what it's receiving. Mongo does the same thing, but Elasticsearch listens onto the log which is sent through to those two different instances, and it uses that log file to actually index everything in Lucene. Right? And it's, it's, it's really good. I mean, it has like a, a nice fluent Java API, but the problem is so that you actually told me that. I was like, you're using, oh, right, they have this nice API, and I was using that and so on. And then we deployed it, and then you pinged me and said like, did you look at the war file, how big it is? It was all of a sudden, it was 16 megabytes bigger. Well, from 2 to 16, you, you, you see that, right? Yeah. So that was an issue. Yes, yeah, a bit unfortunately, because if you include their, their API, you're including basically the whole... Uh, 
Elasticsearch plus Lucene and all these dependencies. So you don't want to do that. You will. So we ended up writing our own JSON client for, um, for their APIs, which worked out pretty well. Yeah, that was very pragmatic. Uh, so it was just a pure, basically doing an HTTP request to, to Elasticsearch and just use the URL uh, class. I and mean, it was very lightweight to, to get that content back. Cool. Any questions on that part? Just yell if you have a question. No, don't be shy. We'll have time for questions later yeah, if sure. they still pop up. So now on to the client. So basically our new heroes. Um, like uh, Ben already mentioned, or Stefan already mentioned, we're, full, we're fully based on HTML5 now. And what's pretty cool is that they have a bunch of new things uh, in there, like the new CSS animations that we use, the, the video playing, the audio recording, um, the, the web workers, uh, and also the, the local storage. And that really uh, allows us to do a lot of things. Um, but that all by itself is not sufficient. So we add a few things there. Um, and you see, it rapidly becomes a huge set of libraries. And it took us a while before we, um, we assembled this, uh, this complete list. But in the end, it's, it, has, uh, it has worked pretty well for us. So uh, if you're looking for a good set of uh, JavaScript libraries and tools, take a picture now, because it will save you some time. So and I, I guess I won't have uh, enough time to go into all in the details of all of them, but I'll just try to highlight uh, a few of them that I think are most important and probably not known to, uh, to most of you guys. So the client that you saw is using all of that. Of course, Jenkins is running you know, on, the, on the staging one, but except for Jenkins, everything is used on the client. Yeah, so the, the first one I'll talk about is, is the required JS. Who has heard of the required JS? Uh, still quite a few. So wh what's, what we see now is that we're going from JavaScript to actually Java, uh, JavaScript applications. So and what, what this brings us is that we need to, to uh, a way to organize our code in, in smaller chunks to keep it uh, maintainable. And, but by doing that, what happens is that you get a lot of script and link, tag, uh, link tags for your CSS. And the downside is that this means that you get all of a sudden a, a hell of a lot more of uh, HTTP requests, uh, which is really bad for your uh, performance because it will, those type of tags, they will block your UI, so they will block your browser for rendering. So it's really important. Um, it's really a problem. And an another thing when, when adding a bunch of uh, JavaScript libraries uh, is that all of a sudden you get a whole bunch of stuff uh, going into the window object, which is our, your global namespace, and that leads to a lot of incompatibilities or hard to track bugs. So those are some things that we need to, to solve. And RequireJS is a kind of nice solution to that, because basically it's a script and, and module loader that does some dependency injection for you. And um, the way it does this is it gives you uh, a way to define uh, each and every module with a bunch of dependencies and then inject them into your code and your code is encapsulated in a sort of like factory function. So that kind of solves this problem of uh, stuff that automatically ends up in the global namespace. Um, what's pretty cool about it is that it will um, automatically load um, your code uh, asynchronously during development which already speeds up the process because, you know, like, um, like I said, all these requests happen uh, sequentially for all your scripts, so uh, require uh, loads them in, in parallel. So that, uh, that speeds up the development process a bit. And, but what is really nice about this is by having all this information about all these dependencies, it can then, for production, it can optimize all this code and like minify your JavaScript and your CSS and then combine them all into one large file. So one large JavaScript file, one large uh, CSS file. And basically for, uh, for our Parlay's homepage, we only need four requests. Uh, so basically our HTML, our CSS, our JavaScript, and one call to the server to fetch our data. So that's only four calls for the, the most critical parts of our website for, to hit the home page. Um, so how does it work? So you just add one line to your code, um, and then you can you configure required JS. You just tell it where your libraries are, for example, and then you can um, add one. Uh, for example, this is a module that you can define where you say, OK, this one, uh, this function, it needs the my file module and then you get, uh, your module gets called when your application starts and you get a call back here to, uh, to do what you need to do. And then it can go even further. You have multiple modules and then, well, you get the picture. Another important part in... Uh, okay, in okay, before you go on, is, does that one also do, do the obfuscation? Yeah, yeah, so that one does the, yeah. the minification. Is the minification is obfuscation. Okay. Yeah. So another important part in, um, in our client stack is Backbone.js. 
Um, it is a minimalistic uh, client-side web framework, um, and it's really tiny in, because it really is just a few basic building blocks that you need to uh, build your uh, web application. It doesn't try to do a whole lot of things in that, in that sense. It's, it's a little less... Um, uh, yeah a little less more constrained, let's say, than, than something like AngularJS. Uh, it, it doesn't really have a, a, an, um, an opinion on you should use this templating uh, framework or that or whatever. You can choose those things yourself. So who's using Backbone here in the room? Yeah, oh, people. Yeah. Interesting. Who uses uh, AngularJS? Yeah, a bit okay. less. And something else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big world out there. <laughs> yeah, but from the JavaScript clients, I frame it, I meant. Yeah. Should have said that. So it's only 1,500 lines of code, including docs, and not minified. So it's really tiny. So it has hardly an impact on your uh, on your download size of your application. But what it then gives you is that you can you can really structure and modular modularize your JavaScript application very uh, very easily because it gives you views, models, and collections, and adds some some infrastructure for routing within your application, and uh, also gives you uh, an eventing model that allows you to. Um, orchestrates all the interactions between them. So then, when uh, doing rendering, if uh, some of us do stuff like this, because like, if you do JavaScript, you do jQuery, right? Um, but if you do anything that's more complicated than, something, uh, than a trivial example than this, it, uh, it, gets, it gets ugly quickly. So, for example, when you want to render something like the thumbnail on the home page, you see you have uh, an image, you have a title, you have uh, a name of a speaker or even multiple. Uh, you have the, the time, the duration of the talk, you have uh, the votes, the views, etc. So if you would do this by concatenating a bunch of strings, it would, it would really get ugly. So one of the ideas we have is actually when you're doing the voting, all the likes, the, the likes, not the dislikes, the likes will be, add, will be added automatically to the talks that we'll publish. So we will censor the dislikes so we don't put the speaker in desk credits, but you already have like a default number of likes coming from the real events. Right. That's so a nice detail. So and for, for, um, for uh, our templating library, we use something like Handlebars.js. Yes. Um, and what's really nice about it is that it can really help us to split the, the data and the code from the actual um, views for the, so the actual templates. So we get this data back from the server, for example, we have the title, we have the counters containing the views, etc., the speakers, and the duration of the talk. And then we, in, we mix this with the actual HTML. I should click here, not there. Um, and then you see here that you have, uh, for example, we have an ID, we have a title, all between the curly braces. Uh, we have the name of the speaker. And what's also uh, kind of nice is that we also have these constructs like the each, so for each uh, speaker, we can iterate over the speakers and then repeat this block. Uh, Make sure you watch your screen because they won't see your face on parlays afterwards. Uh, That's sure. always a mistake. <laughs> speaker <man>. um, <laughs> I can <laughs> I can read my now. slides here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. Um, but then next to these uh, to these constructs, there is um, the you see there there is also talk time and format number, and the guys from uh, Handlebars obviously didn't implement talk time, we did. So that's really cool is that you can also add these uh, helper functions which allow you to manipulate your data. So like you see uh, the um, talk time thing, we have in our data model, you see that we have the duration of the talk as uh, a number of milliseconds, which is very user unfriendly to show this in the screen. So we have this helper function to then uh, convert it into uh, our minutes and seconds. Another part that's uh, really important for us is um, the responsive design. And um, Ben already demoed this, that when, uh, when you resize the screen, so for example, if you have a tablet in portrait mode and then go to landscape, the screen will adapt. Or if, it's, uh, if you view the website on a, on a mobile phone, it will adapt. And, and Bootstrap, which is, um, let's say, a, a, a library of components uh, from the Twitter guys, are really helping here. So it's who, basically... Who knows it? Who knows Bootstrap? And who's who? using it? Yeah, so you can just so, skip those yeah. slides. So you guys probably know what it is. It allows us to do some uh, responsive design and is based upon uh, the fluid grid system that, um, that makes this uh, possible. So and it, what's also kind of neat is that they have a bunch of uh, nice components like buttons and uh, a menu bar and all this that stuff. And it all works uh, pretty well together on it. If you start by using that, you, get, you automatically get a, a nice application without needing to hire a designer. 
But the uh, problem is, of course, that a lot of sites are looking very similar to each other. Yeah, so, so we are based on that, and you can somehow see it, but if you have a good designer, you can still tweak it and uh, make it um, yeah, better. Or style or it, uh, make yeah. it a bit more. Yeah. So we as good Java developers, we do unit testing, but there's no reason that you, can't, you shouldn't be able to do this in JavaScript, right? So there is, um, the, the guys from the jQuery team started doing this and implemented QUnit. And you see the same uh, constructs from uh, JUnit that uh, are repeated in, uh, in, from JUnit that are repeated in QUnit. Like you have the setup and the teardown method, and they basically do the same thing. It's not, in, in this example, it's not doing anything, but you get the idea. And then you just define your test. So for example, here we created an extra method on uh, an extra function on jQuery to serialize a, f uh, a form into a JSON structure. And basically, we're testing it here. And we do an equals. And you have, you have all the same sorts of asserts uh, that you get um, in, uh, in JUnit. So we have a bit of a competition going. The number of unit tests that I write on the server and the number of unit tests that they write on the client. Yeah. Uh, I'm, wi <laughs> I'm winning. <laughs> But anyways, <coughs> we, we, can, we can win over time. I hope so. So, and what's really nice, uh, QUnit comes with, uh, with a web page, and then when you run it, so when you run the web page, or when you, no, when you browse the web page, you immediately run all the tests, and you see here that it's, it runs in, in a, just a mere uh, amount of milliseconds, and you see all the asserts that you do, all the different tests that you get, which is pretty neat. And by combining then QUnit with something pretty cool that, that's called PhantomJS, which is basically a headless browser, you can do kind of neat things in the way that you can integrate, um, you can then run your unit tests on the comment line. And this brings me to the next thing where we can then make it work together with Jenkins and make it output a an, an, uh, Jenkins-compatible JUnit XML file, and then we get all the same uh, results that you're used to from your Java environment. So and that's really pretty nice, because what that also allows you to do, it, it creates actually a website in Jenkins. So I can actually watch every client from every release and see what they've actually changed when I was somewhere else or on holiday or whatever. Yeah, so we created a, an, an extra build script that will then run the required JS stuff and all, that, that, and all those things. And um, because it's only just static HTML and a bunch of JavaScript, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need an app server to run it. So that's... Um, that's a quite, quite nice experience. So who's already using QUnit out of it? You say, oh, not that many. Wow, four people out, there, of, there, out, there of, out of 1,000 people in the room. <laughs> yeah, they don't see that on the video, right? So yeah, so oh, but there, there, there are a bunch of other uh, unit testing frameworks out there for the client to just Pick the one that you like. Um, we're, we're not using a test runner here, and I can strongly recommend Testacular. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's from the AngularJS guys, and uh, this one also works really well. And I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm really wanting to implement this one uh, pretty soon. Cool. Cool. So I guess this brings me to my last slide. I wasn't sure how much time it would take me to go over all this, um, but yeah, you're free to ask uh, all the questions that you want now. I still have 15 minutes, so yeah. Any questions? What about search engines? Yeah, so search engines are, are a bit difficult. Um, there is, however, um, a, a spec by Google which, uh, where you have like um, the hash bank stuff um, in your URL, and, and Google will then spider that. When, when it detects that there is a hash bank in your URL, it will then go to um, it will all make the same request to your server, really? and it adds another name. It replaces basically the hash bang with something else. I'm, 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 I don't know exactly which one it is. Before you run out, don't forget your T-shirt at the reception, right? Okay. Yes. Don't Thanks. forget to vote. <laughs> <laughs> coming back to the search engine, we had the same problem with the flex client. Is that how can the Google yeah. you know, of the world yeah. index the flex client? So what I did is actually I made a static version, a mirrored version in HTML. And that was a static version, so the, the robots could actually index the static version, but when you went to that link through the Google uh, results, it would actually have a JavaScript in there redirecting you to a deep link within the Flex player. Yeah, so we could definitely also do the same technique yeah, uh, so, for, so for yeah, this one. Yeah, one way to avoid it is then to do the other thing that Google is uh, proposing. Yes? Yeah. yeah, I can go back to that one. Oh man. Yeah, uh, there we are. 
I, he wants to take a picture. It wasn't a picture of us. It's <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can stand in front of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, I just thought, because um, uh, you showed the required jazz stuff and the background stuff, uh, and showed um, how nicely you can mod modularize all that stuff. So I just thought I'd I show a uh, quick example of that. Oh, it's OK. Yeah. Should be fine. OK. <laughs> um, it's not really uh, a designed example, but it was, was a test, test for us um, to see what we can do there. Um, so I just have to find it quickly. So <laughs> That's how my desktop looks when I don't put it in a folder to hide it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me explain what, he, what he's going to show, is that um, you can actually embed a talk in you can actually embed a talk in a wiki or a website, <coughs> but what we want to do with the new version is that you can embed the whole channel in your website. So, for example, if Java One puts all the yeah, or just a Java User Group puts all those talks, you know, on a channel, then he or she can actually embed the whole channel in that website, and the people will not even see that it's coming from Parlays. So we did a test for that for Java One um, from this year's edition. Right? Yeah, so it's, it's not beautifully designed, so it's just more about the point that you can do it, and then I will show um, how you do it, and it's, it's really easy then if you have structured your code in the way that you just explained. So um, that could be the Java 1 web page. It's not yeah. really like that, but... Yeah. And then, then you see that we've basically just included the channel page um, that you just saw on the other client, and it's exactly the same thing. Um, so you see the talks and you can go there and you see it's a bit styled in, in, uh, with CSS in, in the style of yeah, Java yeah. 1. And um, just because we have some time, I can sh maybe show a bit of code. So I just wanted to show how easy it is to do that. You need to quickly. make the font a bit bigger. Yeah. Um, come on, one second. I don't know your editor. I use IntelliJ. <laughs> ah, there's a plus. Command plus. Okay. All right. So uh, basically, the only thing I had to do was um, change one file. So um, in Backbone, you have a router that's basically your your base, and there you um, define like what routes your application has. So um, uh, like the URLs, <coughs> and all I did to to do this Java one version where you only see the channel and nothing else um, is to include different dependencies here in my uh, require define function. So, and that's then all I have to do to have a completely different application or a subset of the application or a subset of the real application. Yeah. And we do the same with like the ML client that you can use in your blog. Because uh, that's really what we're getting more and more from customers is that they want to just, they want to use the publisher and the whole environment, but they want to really embed it and basically white label uh, parlays. So that will be one possible, uh, definitely a, a possible way of doing it. Another one will be maybe that we can just license, that you can license the product and install it, like, for example, at a bank and have it on a server, and they can do all the talks and just run it on their intranet. So we're just still a bit looking at, you know, what are the business opportunities, what should be our focus of the team, and, and, and things like that. So your feedback and, and input would be very valuable. And that's why we also give this this platform for free for the Java user groups so they can actually use it and, and you know, publish the content. But we can also then get feedback from you and say, and know what works, what doesn't, what can we improve, like the channel thing. You know, I already saw a few people smiling. Uh, so that's all good. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oh. Yeah? Yeah? Can you tell us a bit more about better storage and maybe find an API which you can use it to store different yeah, For which company do you work? <laughs> so we'll tell you by you, yeah. But what? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Anything specific you want to know? So the quest, the question is, what do we use with, or yeah, what so do we use from file API? So we basically use both, like files, um, a local storage, and the file system API. File system API is unfortunately only available on Chrome. And it doesn't look like Mozilla will ever implement that. So they made a quite clear statement that they are not going to do that. Um, but there are already like shim li uh, polyfill libraries um, for that, so which under the hood use the index DB to, to do the same thing. And you just have to throw them in. And for most of the stuff, that works then the same. So for the, the offline stuff and uh, most of the publisher stuff, use the file system API. 
and then the index DB on, on other browsers. And for smaller data like yeah, login, remembering, and search results, things like that, we, we use the local storage. Yeah. There was another question over there. Yeah, sir. Did we have to give up any functionality yeah, I mean, from Flex to HTML5? When Stefan uh, and I, I mean, as he said, they really had to convince me to, <laughs> to switch to HTML5. Seriously, <laughs> really, like putting his arm like that. I mean, if you've been doing that for 10 years, it's completely out of your comfort zone, right? Mm. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like if you guys have to do .NET now, right? <laughs> so um, I, I wouldn't have thought that it's possible to do all of that. And I don't really think there's anything that we couldn't do, and there's rather things that we can do now. That yeah, that was scary because five years ago when I did a keynote here at Java Polis and explaining to the Java audience why I chose Flex, I really had to like justify it and say like, okay, these are the technical reasons why we're doing flex and air because there's no other option. We tried, I mean, he wrote the JavaFX version, which we showed at the technical keynote of Java 1, but we could never release it because it only worked on Windows. You know, it and didn't work on Mac, it didn't work on Linux. At that time, eh, we were talking five, four years ago here. I think it uh, also opens up a lot of possibilities because if you follow the, the sessions here, you see that a lot of uh, speakers use those uh, HTML slides, so they don't really use Keynote anymore or that stuff. And some use like Reveal JS so with fancy translations and stuff. And like the other guy asked, with, with the animations, what are we going to do there? So uh, the opportunity with the HTML client is that we can just uh, include the HTML slides and then just with JavaScript tell them, um, not go put the, the slide, slide there, but yeah. tell them with JavaScript, go to yeah. that and that slide and have all the animations and everything uh, Native running. Edit. Yeah. Uh, Natively in the browser. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so I, the I browser becomes the presentation tool, basically, which we will then just embrace. Yeah, so I think it opens up more possibilities, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And flex, there, flex and Flash is dead, basically. You know, you have to be yeah, I wouldn't see it. There's I'm a question there. <laughs> I can't. <you> know. <laughs> I have to say that. It's still good for games. <laughs> <laughs> and ads. <laughs> okay, I'll stand here. <laughs> no. Any other questions? Is there one in the back? I can't They're see. in the back. Yeah, just yeah. yell. Can you stand up and yell? I can't hear you, sorry. Are you indexing in the PDF files as well? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, we do. Because we want to... <laughs> well, okay, so what, what I... What it, they, these guys send the PDF to me, and I use PDF to text, which is a binary command, which extracts the text out of the PDFs. Uh, I do that per slide, and then I jump it, uh, put it into Mongo, and have Elasticsearch uh, indexing it. But we can also do it just on the client. Yes. yes. <laughs> You'll see dramatically a lot of functionality will start moving just to yeah. the clients, which is, yeah, pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> Be brave. <laughs> Behave. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? Oh, yeah, it's a good question. Was it not too difficult to make all these frameworks work together? Actually not. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, the, the biggest pain is probably to decide which one to use because there are yeah. so many. And <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, this is what yeah. we used, and it worked very well, but there might be yeah. other options. It was really a puzzle. Eh? I mean, we had yeah. discussion. We do yeah. Google Hangouts every week, uh, every Friday, and we were really like, discuss okay, we're we going to use that one or that one, and there was a lot of pioneering work as well. I mean, there were things yeah, a lot of A lot of experimenting and you know, trying <laughs> different things out, trying different patterns, stuff that worked, stuff that didn't work. You know. well, yeah. it's, it's all still uh, it's evolving very rapidly in the JavaScript uh, community, so, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid this is a bit bleeding edge uh, and not cutting edge, so it's going to bleed and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be painful probably. But, yeah. Yeah, but one, once it's integrated, you see it works, uh, it works flawlessly. It works on Chrome. It seems like all our demos work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like true, true. But uh, I'm afraid, you know, I always have that image of a child eating spaghetti, and that's like the developer trying to support all the different browsers. That's like the image I have, and I hope it won't be that ugly. So we'll see. We'll take it step by step. One more question? Yeah? Yes. So what you see basically here, that's also a bit of the setup we want in Parlays. We video record the slides, and we video record the video, as you saw in the demo. And that way we have both of them. But what we don't want to do is to push two streams. 
because then the bandwidth is really just to, not everybody has, uh, you know, big lines. Especially like in, in Africa, I, I get fan mail from people like from, from all over the world. And like in Africa, they have really not big bandwidth uh, connections. So they actually start downloading a talk in the evening. In the morning, they have that talk, and then they share that talk with the community so they can have it locally, basically. So it's... <laughs> yeah, maybe. You told him? <laughs> oh man, he already knows. How does he know that? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, there's question. another question there. Do we store? Ah, for the player, yes. For the transactional parts, we haven't implemented yet the subscriptions. We will use a dedicated service within Glassfish using MySQL, so we have the full transactional support. Um, so just for the player, the viewing and so on, it will just be Mongo. For the transactional stuff, which needs, you know, um, yeah, like if, when you do payments, like a subscription or whatever, we will have just a dedicated service using the norm, normal MySQL. So we will still have the MySQL stuff in there. Yeah. And, and it are not, it's not uh, the boatload of, uh, of our requests. The m most of our requests are just fetching which, which presentations are in a channel, which uh, channels are in a space and that stuff. Yeah. So. But it's polyglot uh, programming and polyglot persistency and yeah, all polyglot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah, still is. Yeah, def uh, definitely is. I mean, it's a really nice result. So um, we just got started. So um, hmm. it's going to be fun. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Are you putting also the videos in Mongo? No. No, no, just no, file no. system. Any other question? How long did it take to build this version? I, I think actually not so long yet, right? Because, I mean, half of the first year we worked on the iOS client and when did we really start it? It was after the Euros, the soccer. Yeah, soccer. <laughs> then he started to become productive. So that was August, <laughs> September, up to three months. And then I was a month on holiday. Oh, yeah, you were on holiday a month. For, so three months with, with three people. I didn't work full time on it. I mean, I just did the server side, and that was. And neither did I. And you didn't work full time either. And so what we, got, so it wasn't too much work. Works full time. <laughs> no, I mean, we're happy, but this was being a lifestyle product. Right? We want to have fun as well. And I need to organize conferences like this and be jerk. Um, starting from next year. But starting from next year, first of January, we will work full time on this with some other crazy guys who are going to join our team. So seriously, next year, it's going to be kick-ass demo. I mean, it's going to be productive, and definitely in March. Yeah? No, no, that's side. all uh, JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, so it's done client-side. So it was done client-side with the Adobe Air version. And Adobe Air uses ActionScript, and you told me that the ActionScript is pretty, you know, the, the transition from ActionScript to JavaScript wasn't too... No, yeah. no problem. Yeah, but it's client-side. So in the, what we use is basically that we... Don't compare. tell him all the secrets. I don't tell the secrets. Uh, we compare them <laughs> pixel by pixel, so... <laughs> yeah, he told the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think our time is basically up, but we're going to be hanging around here. Uh, don't forget to get your Parley's t-shirt. If you wear it, wear it with pride, and think of us, and uh, thanks for coming.